And some of you guys maybe have heard this story, but you've not heard it from me. You've heard it from him. And I just want to kind of clarify some things that have happened in this story, okay? We were going, and he was prepared as could be. He was so organized. I felt like we were like just going into this thing like completely prepared. He just had this way about him that was non-anxious, kind of knew what he was doing, confident, kind of a humble confidence that he had. And so I was just like, man, we feel good. We are driving along, getting to where we need to be, get there. Everything's organized, great. We, we kind of do some activities together. And then our team on Saturday night, we were kind of, it was an extended weekend. And our team on Saturday night, it was kind of our fun night last night, and then we were going to drive back in the morning. And so what we decided to do was we decided to go out for Philly cheesesteaks. And then from there, we were going to go to the Rocky Steps, kind of get some pictures and that fun stuff. So we went out, got our Philly cheesesteaks. They were awesome, had a great time, meal together. And then we went to the Rocky Steps, and we're, uh, we parked around back, and we took maybe a seven-minute walk, okay, seven-minute walk or so up around front to get to the Rocky Steps. We're racing up the steps. You got middle school students. You're like keeping your eyes on them everywhere. And they're posing as Rocky. They're taking the picture, standing by the Rocky statue, all of the fun stuff. And then we're like, okay, let's load up because we're going to go see the Liberty Bell while we have a little bit of time. And so we're loading up the van. We're kind of walking our way back to get loaded up. And I noticed that I'm walking and I see everybody. I'm kind of counting heads, making sure we got everybody because I really, like that was my job as the intern. It was like, I didn't really know what else to do. So like, oh, everybody's here. Got it. Great. And uh, Joel, I noticed he wasn't with us. And I'm like, well, this is interesting. And so we keep walking. And his wife was on the trip with us. And another leader was with us. And I'm like, do you guys know where Joel's at? And they're like, he'll be right back. Don't worry. I'm like, oh, okay. Sounds good. Not, Not worrying. And we get back to the car. It's a seven minute walk, remember? And so that's a little bit of time for stuff to happen, but not anything too crazy. And we get there, and Joel calls me, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, Joel, what's up? Uh, he's like, I lost them. I'm like, you lost what? He's like, I lost the van keys. I'm like, you lost what? The van keys? Like, what are we doing if you lost the van keys? So, like, literally, he's out there looking, and he's like, could you just check by the van and check, like, maybe in the van if we got to call somebody if I lock them in the van? And so I'm, like, discreetly making sure none of the middle school students kind of find out just like looking underneath the van, kind of looking in the windows of the van. And they're like, why aren't we getting in the van? I'm like, it's fine. We'll just hang out out here and wait till Joel gets back, right? And they're starting to get wise to the whole situation. Like they're starting to figure this out. It doesn't take long. And so literally I tell them, I'm like, I don't know what to tell them. So I tell them, Joel lost the car keys, right? Like we don't know what we're doing, right? And so uh, Joel's out there looking. I'm like, okay, guys, it's going to be okay. We're going to find them. He's like, just misplaced them, right? He didn't lose them. He missed place them. And so Joel is out there frantically searching and he comes back and I have seen an expression on Joel's face that I've never seen before of just like fear and like worry and just like, okay, we got to lead through this, right? Like this is our first mission trip. We're leading together. And I'm like, okay, what's the game plan here? He's like, I want you to just keep an eye on everybody. Uh, I'm going to go out one more time and look because I think there's one other place they might be, okay? And so he runs out there, seven-minute walk, but he's like sprinting. I've seen him run like never before, right? And he eventually found the keys. But I'll tell you this. We had like all of the uh, – it created anxiety in me, but it created anxiety in our students, right? Like the students are just throwing out ideas like, we should go knocking door to door. And it's like getting later and later into the night at Philadelphia. I'm like – and we should see if anybody found the keys. I'm like, we're not doing that. We're not going to go out <laughs> knocking in the middle of the night. That's just a bad idea, right? Because they just had all these questions. What ifs and why? And are we going to have to stay here? Are we going to have to stay another night? They were like pumped about it. I'm like, no, we're not staying another night, right? You, you ever found yourself in a situation like that where, where you have a bunch of questions and a bunch of what ifs and a bunch of whys and you feel like you're in a wilderness like that? Yeah. Sometimes you find yourself in a situation like that. Sometimes you find yourself in a state like that where it seems like we are perpetually in this state. And the answer that our society often gives, the answer to our uh, anxiety that the world gives, is a lot of times it reminds me of the old reggae vibe by Bobby McFerrin. You know, don't worry, be happy, right? Don't worry, be happy. So our answer is, if you're anxious, you just need a vacation. You ever heard that? You need a break. You need to relax. You need to just take a night to yourself. Go buy something nice. Go treat yourself. Eat something good, right? Have a good meal. Just relax. And the song becomes, don't worry, take pleasure. And it's interesting to me 
It's interesting to me that America, we've said this throughout the series, that America leads the way in anxiety. And our solution is to somehow try and numb the, society, the anxiety that we feel, whether that's through your drug of choice, alcohol, porn, smoking, food, uh, whatever it is, binge watching a television show, buying stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff. And I never have like eaten an entire bag of Cheetos and like cookies and watched Netflix for four hours and gone, you know, Kimmy, I just feel so like at peace. Like, you know, like I just... That is exactly what I needed. You know, like I just, the three words I would use to describe myself, it's just non-anxious, peaceful, just delighted, right? Like I've never spent a whole night vegging going, that was what I needed. And most of the time I would guess this, that that you wake up and you're like, man, I'm more anxious now because I know I got to get up tomorrow and I got a job and I got a kid that'll wake up in the middle of the night and now I'm anxious, right? I'm more anxious than I was before. But what happens is the reggae vibe, we all know it doesn't work, but we all like to try it anyway, right? That's the way we operate. That's the way we operate. John Ortberg wrote a small little book called Soul Keeping. I would highly recommend it if you like reading, but he says this. I was operating on the unspoken assumption that my inner world would be filled with life, peace, and joy once my external world was perfect. And he says, that's a great recipe for a healthy soul as long as you live in a perfect world which reality check, we don't, right? We don't live in a perfect world. You know that, you see that. I feel it. That the source of our anxiety is just a symptom of actually what's going on. That anxiety is not the source, but it's a symptom that we live in this anxious age. And the only antidote that we've been saying throughout this entire series is this, that it's the presence of God, not the distractions of our mind that somehow create peace in us, right? It's the presence of God that's the antidote for today. And I'll, I'll be honest, we did a series like this back in the fall at Norton, and uh, it was very similar to this. And so I was really excited to be with you guys, and I'm like, oh, man, this is great. And then I was checking out the podcast. You guys know you have a podcast now? It's pretty cool. You should check it out. But I was listening to the messages from this past week, or the past series, and I was checking it out, and I was just realizing, man, God was wrecking my soul in some unique ways as I was listening to what you guys, the journey that you guys have been on, because here's the deal, we're closing it out today, but here's what I know, that just because we're closing out a serious conversation today, I know this, that our anxiety won't close out today, right? And I would tell you this, I would tell you this, our series ended last time, <laughs> our series ended, but I found myself when I was listening back, all the anxiousness that I kind of low grade, kind of numbed out, it's, it's been rising again in me where I was like, man, God, you've got to do something, right? So here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to just read that passage again. But before we do that, can we just do this? And this might be weird. I don't know. But just take a deep breath in for me. Can we do that? And then audibly let it out. Can we do it one more time? All right, Philippians 4. Philippians 4 says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Lord, I'm asking this today. Would you speak to us? We need to hear from you. We are restless, we are anxious, we are broken, and we're lost people. And we're desperate to find rest, hope, and peace in you. Would you test us today, transform us in ways, and King Jesus, remind us of your goodness, your power, and your love. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We are going through an acronym for this series, right? And so we're going to close out the acronym. In case you've been wondering, you're like, man, last week, last week of the acronym. So it's calm in an anxious world. So we've said this, that we need to celebrate the God who is present, ask God for help, leave it with him, and then this week we'll close out with meditate on good things. Meditate on good things. It's really easy to meditate on bad things. 
there's a lot of bad things to meditate on, right? You look at our world and the current events that are happening around in our day and age, and it's easy to kind of get caught up. If you want to get depressed really quick, just look at the news. The gun violence alone in 2023 will depress you. The disease, the sickness, the racial injustice, the leadership corruption, the natural disasters that we see all around us is pretty easy to get anxious. It's pretty easy to meditate on some bad stuff, right? And we find ourselves meditating on stuff that is really bad. But can I give you a side note just to that, a caveat? There were people all last week that spent their entire life working towards something good. There were a billion good things that happened last week that we just never hear about, right? That people who would wake up every single day and believe there's something better, there's something good to be made, there's something worth fighting and working towards, right? But we hear and we meditate on the bad messages because they're easy. Our brains naturally go to them. And someone once said this, that you don't see the world as it is, but you see the world as you are. You ever heard that before? You see the world, you don't see the world as it is, but we get caught in an algorithm. We get caught in kind of a thought pattern. We get caught in a mindset and an internal soundtrack that plays through our brains constantly, right? And that means what we think about or what we meditate on, it matters. That means this, that what I meditate on, it metastasizes in me. Said another way, what I contemplate, it cultivates, it grows in me. That what I mull over in my mind, what happens is it multiplies within me. Basic thing, that what we think about, it grows. It grows in us, right? And so we'll, we'll say it like this, that we need to think carefully, so think about what you think about. I think what Paul's trying to say is think about what you think about. Um, my wife and I, we love this show uh, a few years back that just wrapped up, This Is Us. You ever seen This Is Us before? Great little show. It's about a family who is in the 80s, born in the 80s, uh, kind of grew up to modern day, right? And so they, they uh, were pregnant. The show opens with them being pregnant with triplets, which is just really intense, right? And they go to the hospital, and in the hospital, they end up losing one of the triplets. And the dad, you just see this scene, it cuts to the scene, the dad just in the hospital hallway, just absolutely devastated, shocked, and like doesn't, heartbroken, just heartbroken. And this doctor who's been with them throughout the whole process kind of comes up over to him and he looks at him and he sits down and he starts talking. And as he's talking, he, he says, kind of, he's an older doctor and he, he says, one day, one day I hope that you'll be an old man like me. And you'll be talking some younger man's ear off like I am. And he says, I want you to say that when you took the sourest lemon that life had to offer, you took it and you made it into something resembling lemonade, right? And you're just like, oh my gosh, this moment, he just said this, the most perfect, beautiful thing, even in the midst of the heartache, even in the midst of the pain. But what we think about, it matters. And what This Is Us is trying to do is it's playing on this principle that we find in scripture. Galatians 6, 7, it says this, Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked and man reaps what he sows. Let's say it like this. If you plant an apple tree, you can expect to get apples, right? If you take a lemon and you squeeze it, you can expect to get lemon juice or lemonade, right? But if you take oranges and you squeeze them, you don't get grape juice. Like that's not how life works. What's Paul saying? He's saying our minds work similar. Our minds work in that way. I like to think in pictures. That's just the way my brain can work. So I think we got a picture. Yeah, so uh, what we ponder is what we eventually plant, and what we plant, we produce. So the, a lot of us, we see anxiety, and we see the messiness of our world around us. And so what happens is we begin to think about, we begin to meditate on our mess. We begin to ponder that. And what we ponder eventually gets planted into our life in such a way that then it becomes who we are, that we ponder what we ponder, we plant what we plant, we produce, and what we produce, we eventually become, we impersonate. And some of us, we are so focused on our mess, we're so focused on our mess that we're becoming the mess, right? That we ponder, if you ponder a thought, you plan an action, and if you plant some actions, you produce a person. One author I read called it, we have a sinkhole syndrome, we have a sinkhole syndrome. And what he meant by that was this, that we focus on our anxiety and when our outer and external world is so loud that our inner world can't handle it, 
we end up collapsing in on ourselves in a sinkhole of our anxiety. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves is we're like, there's so much stuff happening in and around my world. And what we find is we collapse in on ourselves. We get broken because our inner world was not ready for it. That what we focus on eventually forms us, that the stories that we shape and the stories that we tell about ourselves are eventually the same stories that shape us and then are told about us, right? That our thoughts, what we think about, it matters. That our inner world, if our inner world can't handle what's going on in our outer world, we create this sinkhole of anxiety and that's where you land yourself into an anxiety attack, panic attack, and if you've ever had one, they're not fun. You, you, you get that gut tightening, that heart pounding, your mind racing, and yet it's all happening in slow motion at the same time. We find ourselves because, because we've been so focused, we've been pondering and planting and producing this anxiety. So what's the solution? Like, how do we handle this? Well, one, you could do, as John Ortberg said, live in a perfect world, right? <laughs> That's probably not gonna happen. That probably doesn't happen, but we like to try and make it happen. We try and control things, make things happen, control our kids, control our circumstances, control our lives. We try and live in a perfect world. Or two, we can realize that this, that our minds need fixing. Our minds need fixing. Uh, your mind, I, I love you guys, but your mind is broken. Don't tell that to your spouse, okay? That won't go over well, all right? but your mind is broken. My mind is broken. Our minds are broken. And they're not only a little broken, they are deeply broken. There's a neurologist call this that what fires together, wires together, which is kind of a, uh, it's not a bad thing by anything. It's kind of neutral saying. But what fires together, wires together. And what they mean by this is that our brains have these neural networks that have thought patterns that become ingrained in us. So I was thinking about how, to, how do you explain this? And I'm not a neurologist, if you can't tell, right? But, but the best way I was thinking about this was back when I was on the orchard. So I grew up working on an orchard. That's, that's kind of my roots there. I, I worked on this orchard, and uh, on this orchard, uh, we were driving. My boss taught me to drive tractor at 14. So I had this big old blue tractor driving out in the fields. And she, what she had me do the one day, she's like, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to, it was late spring. She's like, I want you to get these apple bins and they have all these old apples in it that we picked last fall. And what I want you to do is I want you to take those apple bins, take them out to the back of the orchard. And when you take them out there, just dump them because they're kind of nasty, gross. Let the animals have them. And so I'm like, okay, nice spring day, smelling the roses. It's just great out there, right? So I'm like 14 years old, driving big tractor. I'm like, this is awesome. And she made the comment to me. She made the comment. She said, if it's wet out there, if it's wet out there, like, just be careful, right? Like, we can do this another day. She said that. I'm like, oh, no worries. I'm not worried about getting stuck. I'm driving this big old tractor. And so I'm out there driving, and literally for six, eight hours, because I had to go slow because I was learning. I was 14, right? And, and we had lots of bins. I probably made 30, 40 trips out to the back of the orchard, way back, come back. And I'd take the same path every time, right? Take the same path, go out there, dump it, come back. And I noticed something, that it was wet, and I started making these ruts. And these ruts became little ruts that became really, really big ruts that became massive ruts. And my boss, two weeks later, she goes, what did you do to my field out there, right? Because it was a main path that we took, and I just tore that thing up, man. I was like driving, I was having a blast, but that field was absolutely destroyed. That path that we always took was destroyed, literally to the point where my uh, several other employees would go out there like two, three years later, and they're like, man, I was cursing your name the whole way out there because I was riding over the bumps of the ruts that you made, Right? That, that these massive ruts, that our brain works in the same way. That our brain can literally get in these ruts, these thought patterns, these systems of thinking. And what we should have done, what we should have done is we should have plowed it all up and put, it, put new dirt down, right? But that was way too hard. We, we just kind of dealt with it. We just kind of drove over it. We just kind of formed in the ruts of our thinking, right? And our driving. And we kept going down where 
what happens is we can find ourselves in a mess of our own making because we can get cynical, we can get critical. Our brain, we start programming it to think in a certain way and we start naturally bending our brains that way. We find ourselves in ruts and rather than plowing it all up and trying to fix it, what we do is we take the path of least resistance because that's what humans naturally tend to do. As we take the path of least resistance and what we find is we get on this cycle of pondering, planting, and producing, and it becomes ingrained into our very being. It becomes ingrained into our very thinking. And what Paul is trying to get at here is he's like, we gotta, we gotta think different. When I was in high school, uh, the, the teachers were all worried about ants. We can't have ants in the building, right? Ants are like, we can't have them. And uh, what we did was my, my friend and I, we were like, well, we wanna test this theory. So our teachers would say, don't put out food because we'll have ants in the building. And so what we did was we wanted to test the theory. So we hid food in the classroom. And uh, the next day we came back and they were right, by the way, there was ants all over that thing, but I don't even know what it was anymore. Like it was just covered in ants, covered in it, just nasty little things. They're crawling all over each other. And ants, psychologists say this, they, they say ants, we all have ants. And what they mean is that it's a little acronym, automatic negative thoughts, that we all have ant infestations in our brain, so to speak that we have these automatic negative thoughts that we get caught in the ruts of our thinking. These automatic negative thoughts. That's why your mind jumps to worst case scenario. That's why when I'm at Philadelphia with Joel, I'm thinking we're never gonna find the keys. I'm gonna have to adopt 15 middle school students. I'm gonna have to get a job working at the Rocky Steps as a greeting for tourists that are coming in. And we're gonna have to pay for their college and weddings one day. Like your mind just jumps to worst case scenarios, right? Because you get in this automatic negative thought loop that becomes this rut in our minds. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think. Think about such things. The word there's logizomai in Greek, logizomai. And what he's literally doing is he's like, hey, pay attention, wake up, think. Don't let your mind go blank. Don't let your mind go on autopilot. You need to consider, you need to believe something that's true. You need to ponder, reflect, reason. It's where we, logizomai is the word where we get logic from. Like we need to logically think about what's going on because in Romans 12 too, Paul also says, don't be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed in what? The renewal of your mind. Because what will happen is you and I will just naturally go path of least resistance. And what that is, is to be casually conformed in our thoughts. One Netflix show, one social media post, one podcast at a time. And we'll casually be conformed in this way of thinking that Paul's like, no, 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 no. Logizomai, wake up, think correctly. You need to be transformed. Form. Don't go numbingly throughout your day. So we can't only think carefully. We have to think intentionally. We need to pick what we ponder. We need to have to pick what we ponder about. Because what you meditate on matters. And you are the air traffic control of your mind, right? If you have thoughts and ideas that are swirling around up here, you determine whether or not they land and whether or not to send them out. You choose that. Like Paul is trying to get us to see that, that we have air traffic control of our thinking. That's where Paul's like in 2 Corinthians 10, that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You know something else I like to do with ants? When I was younger, what I would do is I'd go outside on a nice sunny day and there'd be an anthill. And you know what I'd do is I'd kind of rough up the anthill. All the ants would go wild. And I'd have my magnifying glass in my pocket. Don't you judge me, right? I took the magnifying glass. I get the sun just right. And I burn all the ants, right? Because I thought it was funny, right? Because that's what I did growing up. What's Paul trying to say? Paul's like, what you need to do, take a magnifying glass under your thoughts. You take every thought captive. 
and you look at that thing and you study it. And if that thing is like, man, that's an automatic negative thought, you need to get out of the way and let the sun burn it. Because our minds, he's like, your mind is way too important because what you ponder will begin to plant in your life that will begin to produce something in you. You'll become that person. Paul's like, we need to wake up. We have ant infestations in our mind. And literally, this is what he says. He's like, not all of your thoughts are true, lovely, right, and pure. Maybe it's just me, but I'm, not all my thoughts are that, right? Not all my thoughts are that. That's why Max Licato, some, some of our thoughts are actually lies, and Max Licato says it this way. He says in his book, no problem is unsolvable, no life is irredeemable, no one's fate is sealed, no one is unloved or unlovable, but Satan wants to think that we are, wants us to think that we are. He wants to leave us in a swarm of our anxious, negative thoughts. Satan is the master of deceit and lean in, but he's not the master of your mind. He's not the master of your mind. Satan, Jesus calls him the father of lies, but he is not the master of our minds. That Satan would love nothing more than to release thousands of ants in your brain to somehow infiltrate it. And what he would love nothing more is for you to accept them and invite them in as friends. Because when you do that, that moment, he's got you and anxiety starts to form in you. That our minds, our mind is oftentimes where anxiety is. We can be so self-focused and so self-absorbed and that's where anxiety starts. It's me focused on myself. You've, you've never said this, but maybe you have, is that nobody understands what I'm going through the amount of stress that I'm under, the hurt that I've had to deal with, the hand that I've been dealt, if people only knew what I'm walking through, that we are so self-absorbed, we're so self-focused. There was a study that was done this fall that came out that was honestly a little disturbing in some ways, but a recent study that found Americans are less likely than ever to say this, that the Bible is influencing the way they live out their faith in relationship to others. It said this, that the study went on to say that 10% dropped, there's a 10% drop in Bible users in 2021 and 2022. That would be 26 million Americans that have just reduced or stopped interacting with scripture to have anything to do with their faith that we've become so self-focused that we're starting to believe ourselves and we're not God-focused. Like we're so focused on our stories that we forget his story, that I start pondering all of my problems and all of my issues, that I miss out on his promises. That what we find is that we're so focused on my world and our issues rather than his world and his creation. See, what Paul's trying to get at is we gotta kill the ant and begin to plant something new. We gotta kill the ants. We gotta kill the ants. Philippians 9, he goes on to say this. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. We can't just pick what we ponder. We gotta practice what we ponder. We gotta practice what we ponder. And you know what? Before you start going, man, this makes no sense, or Paul was kind of writing on a hill somewhere just with roses. Remember, Paul was in prison. Paul had lashes. He had scars on his back that were lifted from his skin for how many times he was beaten. And he has the audacity to say, rejoice, and he has the audacity to say, put it into practice so that you can experience peace. See, Paul could have had every reason to sit in a sinkhole of his anxiety and his despair, but he chose to say that the Bible is real. The Bible is just dealing with real people with real struggles. And Jeremiah is one of those people, okay? Can we look at this? Lamentations 3, 3 verse 1. He says this, I, Jeremiah, am the one who's seen afflictions. Okay, here we go. Jump down to verse 17. He's going to go for it. 
He says, peace has been stripped away and I have forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and my homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Well, like, welcome to church, right? That's real. See, he was stuck. It sounds like a guy who was really stuck. He was stuck in a mental state, spiritually, mentally, physically. And notice how much he's focused on himself. And he had legitimate, like, circumstances going on. Like, don't try and minimize that. He had legitimate circumstances that were causing him grief and stress. And what he has, what he does is he's like, I'm going to bring it to God. Which, by the way, side note, God can handle your stress. God can handle it. God can also handle you being real with him. He can handle the unfiltered, unclean version of you. Trust me. He can handle that. But what happens with Jeremiah is he doesn't stay there. Like he could have stayed there and continued to let these ants kind of play in his brain, but he doesn't stay there. He keeps going. In verse 20 says, he goes, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed for his compassion never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will not wait for, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him and to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of of the Lord. Jeremiah's just real, people. Like, he's real. He's like, yep, I don't want to be in this circumstance. Yep, I don't want to have to deal with this. If I could choose it any differently, I would. This is awful. But, but, I call to mind something different. My hope's not found in my circumstances. My hope is found in a God who loved me and gave himself for me. That our hope, our hope is this. It's not found in our circumstances that we must call to mind. What's Paul say? What's true, what's noble, what's right, what's pure. To me, it doesn't sound so much like a list. It sounds like a person. It's like I got to call to mind Jesus. In the middle of my anxiety, in the middle of my stress, I call to mind Jesus and I call to mind his story. And his story is found in the gospel where he will never forsake me. He will never leave me. He will never wrong me. Why? Not because he's just like not gonna do it. Why? Because Jesus was left, he was deserted and he was wronged for my sake and for my benefit. That he hung on a cross for me and died for me. For my sake, my benefit. And that I call to mind that story. I call to mind those promises. I don't listen to a list. I listen to a person, Steve Cuss, in his book. He says, anxiety shrinks the power of the gospel because it presents a false gospel. One of self-reliance rather than reliance on God. That's so Good. The message of the gospel is this, that Jesus, when he hung on that cross, he gave me access to God. He gave me access to rethink. He gave me access to plow up the ruts that are going on in my brain. He gave me access to the kingdom to, that surpasses understanding and shrinks anxiety and is found in a person, the Prince of Peace. It's not found in the changing of my circumstance that the more I run to, the more I recognize the presence of Jesus in my life, the more I run into that, the more he heals my broken mind. The more he heals what's broken in me. And the daily practice of pondering and practicing his presence, it starts to look more like this rather than just me in a circle of my own anxiety. Do we have that next picture? Yeah. That I ponder rather than just my circumstances and my outward, which are real and which are happening, that I don't ponder that. I ponder his presence with me. I ponder that. And what that begins to do is it begins to plant this instinct in my life that when life starts to hit hard, and it will, I'll run to Jesus. And I'll start to ponder his promises and his story. And I'll start to plant that and I'll start to produce that that Jesus, what he calls this later, is abiding. 
He calls this abiding. Dallas Willard has this quote. He said this, people in churches, including pastors, have been crushed with the guilt over their failure at having a regular quiet time or daily devotions. And then even when they do, they find it doesn't actually lead to a healthy soul. Your problem, this is so good, your problem is not the first 15 minutes of the day, it's the 23 hours and the 45 minutes of your day. So what's he say? He says, arrange your days so that you experience total contentment, joy, confidence in your everyday life with God. How, it makes me ask the question, how am I arranging my days? Am I arranging my days around the news, Netflix, podcasting, social media, whatever it is? That's going to do something to me. I'll be casually conformed into sunlight in my thoughts, in my actions, in my becoming? Or am I arranging my day somewhere around his presence where I get in his presence through scripture, prayer, community, in my working, in my everyday work life? Am I somehow going, it's Jesus literally wired me to do what I'm doing and I get to do this with and for him. But see, when I ponder and I begin to practice his presence, it produces a perspective of peace. <laughs> but see, when, when I focus on my problems and I focus on my anxiety, it begins to produce all these fantasies of what ifs and whys, and we end up in a wilderness. That our perspective, it matters. What we think about matters, and there's freedom to be found here. There's freedom to be found here because Jesus, it's not like Jesus is like, hey, go clean up your anxious self and then come in here. Like, there's such good news. It's like, no, 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 no. You come in with your anxious mess. You come in with your anxious self. You come in with your struggles. You come in with your sin. You come in with your problems. You come in with all of your issues. I want you. <laughs> like, I died for you. Jesus, it's like in these moments, it's like, no, I want to just be with you. That's the invitation. Um. I don't study diamonds all the time, but I, I learned a couple things on Google from diamonds, right? Do you know how diamonds are made? They're made under thousands, well, hundreds of miles of rock, roughly 100 miles of rock underneath the earth. And they're made in these high pressure and these high temperatures. And it's this carbon deposits that are in the earth already. And what happens is they begin to be formed into diamonds over a long period of time. Do you, do you see the picture? That right now, in this moment, in this moment, there are diamonds in the deepest, darkest, most silent, high pressure, high intensity, underneath hundreds of pounds of rock that are being formed all over the earth. Some of us, we found ourselves in a sinkhole of our anxiety. And, and we just, our outer world has collapsed in on itself. And we're like, man, God, I don't know what to do. And our minds are riddled with these ants and it feels like every day is the same because it's plug in and plug out. And we've drilled these ruts in our brain. I feel so anxious, so cynical, so negative. And what God is trying to do is he's like, hey, need you to think different. Stop just trying to pleasure. Stop just trying to numb. Stop just trying to be conformed to whatever it is. You don't need a day off. You need your mind fixed. You need your mind fixed and fixed on me. Like God's trying to do something. Rather than being in a sinkhole of our anxiety, God, what he wants to do is he wants to change the perspective. And the perspective is this. To not be in a sinkhole, but be forming as a diamond. That maybe in the roughest part, in the most hardest, intense parts right now, and here's what I know. Here's what I know. In a room like this, there's people that are going through it. And you might be going through it. And what God might be trying to do while you're going through it is he might be trying to work through you. That even in the middle of it, God is trying to form in you a diamond in the midst of the high pressures, in the midst of the high temperatures, that God is trying to shape something, trying to form something, 
trying to work in you, that the greatest work might be happening in the most beautiful, hard, painful ways. And what we tend to do is if in the mess, in the high temperatures and the pressures, we can focus on our mess. But I'm telling you, you can focus on the mess and you'll be a mess. But what God, what Paul is trying to invite us into is don't focus on the mess, focus on the Messiah. Because the Messiah, he's bigger than our mess. He's better than our mess. He's more powerful than your mess. He can handle your mess. That God, what he's inviting you into is to get your eyes and look higher. Look higher than the mess because Jesus, he's in the business of making messes and making them beautiful. Jesus, he's in the diamond forming business. He wants to form diamonds who are beautiful who have rough edges and who are strong. And I'm telling you, God is trying, your greatest pain might become God's greatest work. That God is trying to do something. So I'm going to invite the band to come up because the invitation that Jesus is making is very simple this morning. It's very simple. It's not to focus on a list of 10 things that we should think about, but it's to ponder his presence. It's to take our eyes off the mess and focus them on the Messiah. Because he can handle it. Hebrews 4, 16 says this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That we are invited to abide in the person of truth. Some of us, we need to go home today and just rearrange our calendar and our schedule and our thoughts. Because we're casually being conformed. And what we'll find is we'll be in a mess of our own making. And what Jesus wants to do is so much more. He's forming a diamond. He wants to transform what's going on. He's waiting. He's waiting with grace. He's waiting with hope. He's waiting with healing. He's waiting with help. So it's simple. Instead of looking at your mess, instead of looking at our mess, we look to him. And so Jesus, I just pray for us in this room. God, would you forgive us? Would you forgive me, Lord, when I focus on my mess and I focus on my circumstances and what's going on around me? And I get distracted. God, would you forgive us and would you focus us? Lord, show us your presence in our mess. Give us perspective. Remind us of your hope and your help. God, would you heal our minds? And God, would you allow us to rearrange our days around Jesus? around your presence and not just be casually conformed. God, I know there's stories in here and some of us are an anxious mess. We're walking through wilderness of what ifs. We're walking through wilderness of whys and we're not sure why we're here. And so Lord, I pray that you would be real in the middle of it. God, I pray that we would be real in our struggle with it. God, would you in this room would you in this room, through these people, through us, would you form diamonds? Would you form diamonds that are made in the rough of it? That are beautiful? Would you form us into people that love Jesus? Because God, we don't have to try and fix it all. But God, would you let us be shaped by the person who is not anxious and who's full of peace?